these are the main tenets for this paper. So you're supposed to be easily accessible, published regularly, they've got to contain current information, and they've got to contain a variety of topics, and they have to have text divided into columns. So that's the main features of a newspaper. We'll look straight away at the very early ancient newspapers. Um, when the earliest ones was in China, Tipao, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, and they were in use by 202 BC, so really early, and they were basically palace reports or imperial bulletins um, and really intended for diplomats, so they didn't get a massive general circulation, but they were around the government people. Um, Ancient Rome, you had the Acta Diurna, which again were daily gazettes or news sheets created by the government, but these were for public information. Um, and they were published as early as 131 BC and they contained political news, military campaigns, trials or executions. But as you can see in the picture there, they were actually chiseled in stone. So doing a daily news report and having to chisel it in stone must have been quite hard work for the actual typesetters, I would think. It's not the sort of thing you can do really quickly. Um, I don't know if we've got any of these from the from um, Britain. You know, we might have what you'd expect them to be done in London, possibly, um, or maybe even Syracuse. I don't know. I've not been able to find any information on that. Um, moving on a bit, the idea of movable type was sort of developed by the Chinese around 1040, um, and that basically involved setting pages of type with individually classed letter forms, and then you could run these off on a hand press. Um, and it's we're not sure how the how it happened, but this technology seems to have sort of spread westwards, reaching Europe around about 1400. Um, the first real big epic in that I suppose was 1440 when Johannes Gutenberg or Gutenberg which we've all heard of him um, he, he came across this system and he used it to invent the first mechanical printing press um, and for the first time this idea of making this press you could actually do multiple multiple copies of the same thing very very quickly um, and this is a, a quite a famous woodcut image of a sort of type a sort of printing shop basically you can see in the background the two men on the sort of the uh, a-frame they're setting type and then you've got the actual printers nearer to us the one on the left is actually setting the pages and the one on the right is inking the paper um, now what's important about these these presses is that they that they can produce you know up to or over 3,000 pages a day compared to 40 or 50 by hand printing and just a couple by actually hand copying so they were a tremendous advance in sort of getting information out there um, like most printers, we know Gutenberg used high quality paper made in Italy, usually from Cassile in Piedmont, northern Italy, in that little cluster around there. Um, and one particular Cassile paper manufacturer used a bull watermark. And you can see this picture here on the left. Um, this is from one of the earliest copies of the Gutenberg Bible. It's from the British Library. And you can see this lovely bull watermark. And the, the reason I've, I've included this is quite simply, this paper was also used in one of the Gloucester Borough Council's red books, their minute books. Um, the earliest one dates to 1486, finished in 1648, but that also uses this paper. So, you know, straight away we can see Gloucester were obtaining paper from somewhere in Italy to actually use in their minutes. Um, this, that actual minute, the actual watermark itself is about sort of three inches tall, so it's quite, quite a big one and it's quite nice to see. Um, Printing, actually like Gutenberg used, is inter introduced into England by Caxton. We've all, all heard of him. He was technically a mercer who worked in the Low Countries, but he encountered and was clearly impressed by printed books. So he actually went to Germany, to Cologne, and learned how to print, then came back to Bruges and established his own press. Um, about 1476, he returned to England and set up a printing shop near Westminster Cathedral, not in it, as this rather sort of nice picture shows, Victorian one. Um, but, you know, he was prolific between 1476 and 1492. So, you know, not many years, he published over 100 books, mostly in English. There are some in Latin, including 14, 1477, The Canterbury Tales. And that's one of the probably one of the most famous ones he actually produced. For the next 200 years or so, printing generally restricted to books and woodcut images. Um, a major advance was the use of images on title pages, which were used to try and summarise the content of the book in a pictorial form. This is Holbein's Bible of 1535, with rather beautiful paint uh, drawings and woodcuts on the one side. Um, the combination of 
printed word image came together in, in things called broadsheets or broadsides. These are also referred to songs later on, but this time they're actually, it's actually newspapers or news information. Um, these were usually just single sheets of paper, various sizes sold by street vendors, um, quite cheaply as well. There were, however, another branch, they were known as chapbooks, and they used single sheets again, but these were folded uh, and then cut to make small booklets or small pamphlets. Um, and so these were again very very important. Um, most of these were written in plain English uh, and they were sold let's say as little as a penny and they were very very available to common people if you could read. Um, there are very 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 few survive. Um, this is one of the reasons. Once you'd read them you used them as loo paper basically um, and so there are actually not many surviving at all. Um, in the, I think there's only sort of literally thousand or so that, that actually survived from this time because they were again, not wasted and they, of course they, once they're used like that they're going to decompose nicely. Um, political crisis of the 1640s proved to be a very, very fertile breeding ground for broadsheets. And I'm sure we all like this picture here. You know, this is the Cavaliers on the left and the Roundheads on the right with their dogs fighting and everything. Two in poodle and biting pepper. You know, I love this, love this picture. Um, but the Civil War actually gave publishers a whole new way of thinking because for the first time the opposing sides had to win people to their sides rather than just saying come on we're going to go and fight that lot come with me so that's sort of the idea of the old feudal system it broken down there so you could almost choose who you wanted to fight for um, so for the first time these printed news sheets began using propaganda and um, both sides used it and they thought it was necessary to do it scare the other side into saying this is what they're going to do to you um, so come to us and fight for us um, and the bottom pictures is off of the uh, Cavalier, the Irish Rebellion taking place, you know, where they're allegedly impaling babies on spears and beating them and things. So not very nice, but, you know, it's been with us ever since. Um, in this battle, Parliament had the advantage because obviously Parliament controlled London, where most of the large scale printers were based. So they had a natural advantage here. And we know that between 1640 and 1660, there are more than 30,000 publications printed in London alone. You know, that's an awful lot of material flying around. Um, and there's also at this time, there began to be a bit of a distinction. So while the single sheet broadsheets came to present, say, the more sensationalist end of the market, so the, the tabloid sun and the daily mail end um the chat books they became known as news books and they took what we'd call now the more heavyweight end so they were more of the sort of the times and the telegraph and the guardian they tended to be thicker and have more pages um, these again used actually very few illustrations because they had to be printed quite quickly but at minimal cost and of course creating a woodcut image or, or a metal type image at the metal printing image at the time was quite time consuming and expensive so they tended to use stock images like you see on this one the mercurius civicus stock images and then that would be it they might that might put every front page and then there'd be nothing inside um so these stock images and say they tended to split and you had these two very very famous ones these were the sort of the newspapers if you were for the parliament and newspapers for the royalists so they have the perfect diurnal diurnal which is the parliament one and the curious orlicus which is the royalist one and these were printed quite often and actually you know this is a whole idea they're full of what the enemy has done how nasty they've been you know how good we were sort of thing so they were perfect propaganda tools really and the one on the left is, is from we've got that in the archives collection and the one on the right uh, is actually from the British Library we don't appear to have any of those in the archives sadly um, moving abroad um, the first actual weekly newspaper technically was the German one I'm not even going to try and pronounce it I can get as far as relation Allah and then I give up um, that's published in 1604 in Germany again that was a daily current one um, but in 1618, you had the current Italian and Deutschland, the world's first folio size, that's a large sheet, published in Amsterdam. Um, and it was called the current in Italian Deutschland. So it basically meant current news in Italy and Germany. And that was it. And the idea of these things soon spread. And before long, newspapers were being published in Spain, France, and Sweden quite regularly. In this country, if you ignore the perfect diurnal and the Mercurius Olicus, the first actual newspaper, which was 
paid for by subscription, um, was published in 1665 in Oxford, um, known as the Oxford Gazette, and it originated simply in Oxford because Charles II had moved his court to the city to avoid the great plague that was then running in London. Um, when that finished and the court moved back to London, the Oxford Gazette simply moved back with it, and then it became known as the London Gazette, and it's remained known as that ever since. And it's, of course, it's, the London Gazette is still being published today. Um, 1700s saw the establishment of many newspapers. By 1720, we know there are 12 London newspapers, at least 24 provincial ones. Now, you know, the government didn't really like newspapers because they constantly criticised the government, and quite rightly too. Um, so the government actually tried to subdue them by various means. You had censorship they could use, licensing, bribery even, that was quite frequent, uh, prosecution and corruption. But despite, despite this, by 1753, um, there are nearly 7 million newspapers sold in, in Britain a year. Um, and to fund themselves, by this time, newspapers had cottoned on the idea that actually you could put a notice in here for a few pennies and we'll print it for you. So they sold advertising space and they mixed it up with political news, commercial news and, and social and natural news. Um, so why are newspapers so big? It's, it's a, a thing that many of our old, old newspapers were huge um, and a few of them actually didn't preside that way until recently. The simple reason was due to the Stamp Act of 1712 and that levied a tax of a penny per whole newspaper sheet, a half penny for a half sheet and one shilling per advert within those. Um, so that would actually ultimately prove quite expensive. You had a newspaper of say 30 pages. So all the publishers did was they simply began printing bigger papers but with fewer papers and that reduced what they paid um, and that stayed the sort of the, the, the way for many years they became ultimately known as broadsheets um, and because actually as they progressed they got more and more intense few people could read the required standards so they very quickly became associated with the aristocracy and businessmen um, recently of course due to costs things have shrunk back down um, if they're published at all so you get I'm not sure how much how many broadsheets there are now it's probably I think the times is still a broadsheet isn't it but you know certainly there are sort of tabloid sized editions now so let's have a look um 10th of March 1722 an advert appeared in Gloucester on posters around the town um, and this is this is the advert we have a copy in the archives and I'll just let you have a little read of that while I have a quick slurp excuse me a second So this advert appeared. Not many people knew what it was for, except they really don't know what's a newspaper. This would have been the first, probably the first one in Gloucester. There's a little bit of a problem for with it though, unfortunately, and that's sort of the second line. So it's against the Swan Inn in Gloucester. We don't know exactly where the Gloucester Journal was first printed, as that word, that word in phrase could refer to the Black Swan in Southgate Street, the Swan and Falcon in Longsmith Street, or the Old Swan or the White Strong in Westgate Street. There's also an evidence of a Wild Swan. So there are at least at least five pubs in Gloucester known that had Swan in the name, and so we're not quite sure where Against the Swan Inn was. But whatever happened, it all worked, um, and the Gloucester New Journal was founded. It was founded by Robert Rakes, um, but that was a spin-off partnership from the Northampton Mercury, where Rakes was already in partnership with a chap called William Dicey, and that's his picture on the right there. Um, Rakes, note as a pioneer of the press, instrumental in bringing new news out of London and into the provinces, starting in Northampton, but then spreading around. Sadly, we don't have a picture of Robert Rakes. There's one that's just recently been found, so I thought I'd, I'd be funny. And there's his burial entry from St Mary de Crip Parish Registers. Um, and uh, he's, there he is, he's there on the 11th of September, Robert Rakes, gent. So, you know, it's not, it's not a bit unfortunate we haven't got a picture of him. Um, we do have a, have a picture of his tomb. He died on the 17th of September, 1757, and buried at St Mary of the Crypt Church. That's the tomb there. Uh, he's also buried with his wife and his son, Robert Rakes, the younger, who became famous for promoting Sunday schools later on. He's got the tablet at the, at the very bottom there. Um, and that's thanks to Discovered the Crypt who have actually you know, taken that photograph for, for us today. Um, 
interestingly, as well as the newspapers, these two men actually sold the medicine. Um, Dr. Bateman's pectoral drops. Uh, that's a couple of ad adverts for them and, and, a, and a sort of a later sort of medicine file. Um, it was a type of tincture of opium and camphor. Now, tincture is basically a drug mixed with alcohol. So you've got alcohol, opium in here. So it's got to be good. Um, it was used for disorders of chests and lungs and was marketed as a remedy for all rheumatic and chronic complaints in pains of the limbs, bones and joints for influenza and in violent colds. Um, there's quite a bit on the internet about this medicine actually and it survived quite a long time and there is all sorts of various sort of medical um, theses on how good it was and then of course there's ones on how bad it was and everything but as a general rule it is sort of one of these quack medicines that you'll see but it goes to show that they actually the two men as well as printing the newspaper one of the reasons they wanted to do it is they wanted free advertising for their, this, this medicine. So that features in the echo and uh, the echo in the journal. Um, Monday, the 9th of April, 1722, first ever Gloucester Journal was published. And this is the title page, woodcut on the title. And it's one of the few times they ever used illustrations in the, in the paper. Um, very thin, only four pages, and you know, like many newspapers of the time and today, uh, it was largely a cut and paste job. They took news from other papers, notably the London Gazette. Um, initially, it cost threepence, which works out at the time about one pound fifty today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you can see at the top, you've got the picture, we'll look at that in a moment, and then you've got a nice big preamble, and then you've got news, and straight away, most of you'll see it says, and from the London Gazette. Tuesday, April the 2nd. So it actually goes back, takes paper that's news that's like a week old for another paper. So there's a zoom on the first front cover of there. It's quite a nice one. Um, the main figure is the god Mercury. And you can see the city of Gloucester arms or the Declare arms on the lower right. That's the shield with the sort of the, the chevrons and the, and the sort of spots there. Um, various things. You've got various nymphs sort of writing for Mercury. And you've got a nymph bringing more news. There's a ship coming into sail, obviously bringing news. Um, what I like about this is Mercury is the god of financial gain, of commerce, eloquence, messages, communication including divination, travellers, boundaries, luck, trickery and thieves. And he also serves as a guide to the souls of the underworld. He probably still works for the tabloids today, mm -hmm. I think anyway. But again, one of the few times they used it, but it's a nice image. Um, another area image here, this is, you know, we've probably all seen this, this picture before, but it came from the journal of 13th of April and shows the southwest prospect of Gloucester. Um, it's still quite a nice image, it's a standard sort of stock image of Gloucester at the time with the various churches there, Mary de Lode, the Cathedral, St John's, St Nicholas, St Michael, St Mary de Grace, which is gone now, and St Mary de Crypt. And it's also got the very forefront there, the Westgate Bridge and the very famous Glass House Kiln. And it's also got a couple of rather nice boats in there, although the scales are well off. The two ones with single masts are probably trows. The one at the back looks like it's a brig. Um, so the journal actually had a huge circulation area, especially when you compare with the like, modern provincial newspapers. Um, and this, again, is a sh record we've got in the archives. It's a poster from, from the collection. Um, and it gives you, you know, if you read it, it's difficult to read on the small screen there. Um, but I've gone through it and it gives us the limits of distribution. So, in, so it goes up as far as Starbridge in the north, as Farringdon in Berkshire in the east, Carmarthen in the west and Salisbury in the south. So that is a huge area. Um, and really the main reason for this was basically they had to reach a, a sort of level of sales that made it sustainable and that was they thought that was around about a thousand copies so given the sort of the relatively limited numer uh, literacy in the area you had to sell it over a much larger area so this is why you know we'd also combine Northampton papers here and Cornish papers and Wiltshire papers so newspapers spread themselves quite wide Journal went from strength to strength. 1725, Rakes took sole ownership. So him and Dicey, William Dicey, parted ways. In They were very amical about this. Um, and we think Rakes had now moved to Southgate Street, possibly to Robert Rakes Inn or the Robert Rakes House. This is where it published it might have been printed, although there is a further printing shop down the road that on the corner by the Kimbrose Hotel that might, it might have been printed at as well. Um, 1757, Rakes died and succeeded by Robert Rakes the Younger. And that's a picture of him there on the bottom. 
uh, he used it to further his philanthropic aims and he successfully ran the paper for the next 50 years. Um, of like 1802, when he was 65, he sold it to David Walker, who again was a printer of the Hereford Journal. Um, rates are very canny here. For the sale, he received 1,500 quid and an income of 300 pound a year. In today's money, it's about 65,000 and an income of 13,000 a year. So he did pretty well out of this sale um, and it didn't seem to affect the newspaper at all. The journal continued to go from strength to strength. So let's have a quick look at the layout. Um, okay, so like most of the day, the journal was a broadsheet and used very, very tiny point type, 10 to 11 point really. Um, you know, it's always worth, if you have to get an original out from the archives, and we'll look at how we do that later, it's always worth to have bringing a, 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 a spy glass with you, a magnifying glass, that's the word I'm trying to desperately find, to use it, because they can be quite small. Um, they also evolved into a standard sort of pattern. So after a while of looking, you know where in the newspaper to look to find what you you're looking for. Um, this is actual paper, they're always published on a Saturday, uh, and this is the standard layout. So the front cover usually consisted of a column of news on the left hand side there. Um, that was dropped as time went by because they actually found it was better to put adverts there. Um, you also got some official notices such as turnpike tolls to let or boards of guardians and items, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then adverts, and most of it was adverts, and as time passed, adverts grew much, much more important to the paper and virtually the whole front page became just advertising. Page two, broadly similar, common news, more official notices. Usually these were the longer, more important ones, so tithe commissioners notices or company notices, etc. And then you get adverts. And it seems to settle around, on this page, you usually got let, get the to let notices or sales of livestock and property, auctions, that sort of thing. It can vary. Page three, much more varied. International stocks and shares, bankruptcies, which were then considered to be very important news, the market prices, BMDs, birth marriages and deaths column, corn prices, and of course for a lot of this time in the 1800s, 1830s, corn laws and the corn prices were critical. Um, you get and usually get a column in new, royal news, you usually get an item or two of politics, you then get crime and police intelligence, which sort of relates to the number of crimes and everything they had around, not necessarily in Gloucestershire, could be noticeable crimes across the whole country. You also got sailings, you can see a little picture of shit, we'll look at one of those later. You finally get a little bit of local news on this page, usually no more than a little paragraph in there, uh, and adverts as well. Again, you're always going to get the adverts. But you can see from the general look at it, it's, you know, it's quite hard to figure out what's doing what. And with those stories, they tended to have just a, a half a sentence was the actual important bit of the news from so and so, and then you'd have the story. Back page, more of the same. Um, nearly always included a lottery, and lotteries were quite a big business back then. There are quite a few of them around. You then have book adverts, and it's oddly, it often seems to be for ladies' memo books, pocket books, or journals. And on this particular newspaper, virtually the middle section are all just book adverts for ladies' memoranda books. So I thought you ladies needed to be writing about and know where you had to be, but it's obviously very important at the time. You then had auction sales. Again, this was usually for properties, land, or farms. So whole things and then you had some more patent medicine adverts. Um, a couple of typical adverts here so I'll let you have a quick look at those. Again my we'll lights sort of whip me whistle again. It has to be said that adverts are probably some of the best things in the newspapers. They are really they can be really interesting. So on this one, for example, we've got a whole farm being sold. And again, if you're interested in local history in a particular farm, you know, you know it might have been sold. It's always worth having a look at the newspapers, you know, especially if the earlier ones where we might not have sales particulars, look at the newspaper and you might find a lot of information. This one, particularly for Norton Farm, you know, that's a, that's a good amount of information that gives you the number of buildings, how much acreage it had. So they get really important. The um, strayed advert on the on the top right of your screen, they do crop up quite a bit. Um, very often they're strayed, brackets or stolen. Um, and again, you know, 
look at this one two two-year-old heifers you know six or six two-year-old heifers four of them northern kind two like given the description of these animals you know and it usually gives a sort of reward so you know if you give this go back to samuel beddington so i've seen your cows you'll give you a guinea if he gets them back you know which is quite a lot of money you do get small adverts like on the lower left here so this is an advert for the tenants of the sea in gloucester if you've not paid your rents cough up now please it's way past it and then you get deals which is obviously timber length wood um fine christiani deals from finland basically now lying in the in the yard of john shewell in stride you know and i do like the uh Gentlemen and trades would make supplied upon reasonable terms, you know, and I'm not exorbitant, I'm not cheap, reasonable. I like that one. It's good. And then on the bottom right here, we got the ladies' new memorandum book, you know, and you can see all the things it's got in there. So it, it's quite a lot of stuff there, quite interesting. You know, all your holidays, your extracts from accounts for presenting abuses of the Lord's Day and everything, you know, a marriage act thrown in there for good measure as well. So then again, they're great books to look at as well. Moving on. This is the sort of the, almost like the boring bit, really. The typical news. Um, very often, as you can see on the one on the left here, this is from the Admiralty Office. Captain Malcolm of His Majesty's Sloop, the Rattlesnake, arrived at this office late on Sunday from North America. Of course, we tend to forget now that at the time, all this news is probably three, four, maybe maybe even two or three months old because I had to get to the country before it could be published. And these two are particularly about, say, 1781, about the time of the American War of Independence. Um, and there's a letter on the right here, you know, again, it's stated as news, but it's saying, you know, well, how, you know, how many men have we got? How has this happened? And it, it was quite a shock at the time. But, you know, there's lots of news like that. You never get massive news headlines in these papers. They are always fairly small letters. An example of this on the right hand side at the bottom of the one household goods to be advertised sold it's now been disposed of by private contract it's not taking place you know, not much there transport you always find lots of transport information in, the, in these papers um and this was some various coaches and stage coaches which of course were the sort of the only things that you could use really from up until up till the 1830s 1850s anyway um you know, and they tended to advertise, you know, what mails were going where and from and when they should arrive and everything. The advert at the top right one about the diligence is quite a nice one. Um, there was a big difference between the diligence and a normal stagecoach. And, and this is a this is a diligence. They were quite small, fast carriages, carried three passengers, sat abreast and one driver. Um, and they were recommended for their speed. Even so, typical journey, London to Bristol took about 19 hours. You know, imagine being stuck in one of those for 19 hours with only a few breaks. Um, but thanks to Hobnob Press for that one. Um, it's a great book if you're interested in stagecoach travel. Bristol Stagecoaches, published by Hobnob Press. Fascinating reading. Really good book on all the history of stagecoaches. Shipping. I mentioned this earlier. Um, shipping information featured arrivals and departures but you found a lot of information they would give you where the ship had come from its name where it originated from so its home port usually it gave you its its captain usually its cargo who the cargo was for so vast amounts of information again if you're interested or you've looked at say the port border trade records for ships you know you maybe want to try and find out exactly when ships sailed it's always worth having a look in these newspapers the journalists is fantastic for it and they didn't pick it up just from Gloucester as you can see at the bottom right you know from sharpness as well um, social comment you get a bit of this in the end usually as adverts um, so you know, I've picked up these two because I quite like the chartists so you've got this one from Cheltenham in pursuance of an order issued by the government the magistrates had a private consultation on Monday last to concert measures in the event of a disturbance taking place um, the newspaper was quite down on the, on the chartists has to be said they thought they were a pointless activity and uh, there's one in there in Cheltenham we don't think anybody in Cheltenham will riot whatsoever so it's quite it's quite interesting but you do get lots of ones like this one here from al pen and on the middle right here middle left sorry um whereas many persons upon coming in this manner and beating the woods under color of shooting cocks do make frequent practice of destroying the game i give notice that all such that whenever they are seen here in future with guns or dogs prosecution shall be commenced so basically it's just how po poachers to mind your own business and get off my land basically you do also get absconders so here is william matthias has left notice it's left his ironworks at pembrokeshire and again this is where again this 
papers taken you from elsewhere. So a lot of the things in these papers don't actually relate to Gloucestershire. They're from elsewhere, but they've put them in there because they're circulating it broadly. This is quite a nice one. They usually took in deaths from the London Gazette. Um, and again, if you're interested in the medical side of things, you know, some of the actual um, things that people died of are quite interesting. Um, you know, you got classic ones, you know, it's consumptions, convulsions, dropsy, you know, jaundice, things like that. Um, but you get you get nice ones <laughs> which do make you sort of like, you know, smile at times, like the, the bottom of the middle car, rifing of the lights, um, which is quite a nice one, and stoppage in the stomach, twisting of the guts, you know. So there are lots of ones in there. Um, you know, the casualties distinguished from deaths, I'm not quite sure why, um, but they are. But again, these are primarily London ones and not local, but they're, they're always worth looking at they're always quite interesting um, and you do get other ones this is a nice little one from Painswick about some vandals uh, I'll let you know how quick we do that we'll have another slurp here so you do wonder with this one what was going on here was this sort of you know Miss, miss sort of unhappy youths just doing it or is this something different was this you know maybe was this any non-conformist sneaking into the church and doing it they've also had some trouble before you know very interesting so you know what we think is a modern problem isn't quite a modern problem it has been around for a while so as time passed um and other papers appeared which we'll look at in a moment um the journal became popular but it gradually became more focused on being a pictorial paper and i guess most of us remember it really as a pictorial paper um, it focused mainly on city events and celebratory occasions and that included rural visits weddings clubs it was very very keen on showing sporting events and sports clubs um, and these just a, a quick sample of some of them um, you know they are again fascinating if you're looking at events in local history or even family history you know sometimes we'll nearly all have relatives in there i would think if you're, if you're gloucester based um again these are hard copy and we'll, we'll look at we'll look at how you can have a look at these a little bit a little bit later there were competing papers for the journal um Gloucester Gazette and South Wales Advertiser, Gloucester Gazette, Gloucester Herald. The only the main rival was this one, the Gloucester Chronicle, um, started in 1833 as a pure Tory newspaper, whereas the journal was always closed class itself as a liberal Whig newspaper. Um, the Chronicle was incorporated into the Citizen in, in quite late, 1992. So it's a, it's a little, it did survive, but it was in various means. And again, you can see it's the same sort of thing. You've got lots more adverts on this one. No news at all on the front page. So the Citizen first appeared in the streets of Gloucester, May the 1st, 1876. Um, again, four page daily newspaper, cost half penny. Um, launched after a very, very clever advertising campaign. For the previous month, there were lots and lots of posters went up around the city just bearing the word citizen, nothing else. And it piqued everybody's interest and people were all out, you know, what was all this about? They wanted to know. And of course, on the main of the day, it went out 3,000 copies and they sold out completely. Um, we've only got one copy, I think, in the archives. But again, you can see what they've done here. They've dispensed with any news on the front cover and it is just purely adverts and again this was where they established nearly all their income from really the actual selling was not much at all you know what they wanted with the money from the adverts um it was owned by samuel bland um published in st john's hall which is now tk max in gloucester but it later moved across the lane um, into an old beer house where it stayed until 2006 before it moved into cheltenham um January 1879, it merged with the journal, the two publishing houses got together, uh, and they did very well. Um, 1879, February the 25th, Citizen achieved record sales of 10,000 copies. So again, it was, it was a, it's a well-liked well -liked newspaper. Um, it matured very nicely. There were up to six daily editions, plus a Saturday edition containing a weekend magazine. There were local editions, so Stride and Forest had local editions. And I'm sure we all remember the Pinken, which was the pink, the pink, pink newspaper, pink paper one, always published at about half past five on a Saturday night with all the 
sports news in. And I remember certainly, you know, my rugby playing days, you know, everybody could, somebody would have to be sent out to get a pink and to come back and see how all the other clubs had done and everything, you know, it was great fun. Um, I mean, the Simpson again was a broadsheet, it shrank a tabloid size, you know, like most new clips have to do today. Um, it's now gone back fully enough to what the journal used to be, a week newspaper just due to sales. Sadly, I think we're all probably all aware that the standard of journalism on the sit on the citizen now is atrocious or Gloucestershire live as it has. You know, it's they can barely write or read the Queen's English, so I've been told. Um, Echo was one from Cheltenham, um, daily and evening paper established in 1873 as the Evening Telegram, changed its name to the Echo in 1882, um, and it was really purely Cheltenham based, but it did branch up into the Cotswolds, so Bishop's Cleeve, Cheltenham, Morton, North Leach, Stowe and Tewkesbury. Um, Again, follow the same sort of format, but by now, you know, this is the this is a little bit later when you can see we are getting news on the front. The adverts are very small, more discreet, and they more appear in sign. So newspapers by the sort of this time, by the 18 the 1920s anyway, have to realise that people want news on the front, not advertising, so they're hiding the advertising. The Tewkesbury Register and Agricultural Gazette, um, published in July 1858, a conservative newspaper, took its name from the annual Tewkesbury Really Register and Magazine, but that only lasted a couple of years, um, and then re the Register took over. Um, absorbed into the Eversham Register in 1930, but it retained its own name. Um, now, for some reason, these are really, really large newspapers. They're like a yard wide, you know, and a yard long, and they really are difficult to handle. Um, and they're not on microfilm, as far as I can remember, um, but if you do have to have hard copies of these, you have to be very, very careful of them because they are horrendously crumbly newsprint. And there are some that we actually can't produce, but they are huge ones, these, you know, and you, you'll always get a, a look on, if you order one from the, search room team they'll always go oh god no not those things because they are literally massive and they weigh half a ton um much more much more user friendly which a children chronicle and gloucestershire graphic um again these are in the search room all bound into nice blue folders um and they were advert heavy but they're patronized by very wealthy families tended to be and you get family announcements weddings and social events of the great and the good in there um you know one of the best things about these is during world war one they actually started publishing thumbprint images of, of the sailed soldiers and sailors and airmen who'd lost their lives so they are very useful in family history to go back and look at them and they're quite interesting to read you do get other things as well but uh, you get nice uh, adverts for guns in there oddly enough you know revolvers come and buy your revolvers from fletchers and show them you know kills germans better that sort of thing and they're really interesting adverts um there are lots, of course, lots of other newspapers, and we haven't got time to look at all of them today. So you, the most famous ones, I guess, Dursley Bark and Sharpness Gazette, which went through various combinations in various places. The Dean Forest Mercury, the Forester, <coughs> the Stroud Journal. Um, if you're interested in what we have at the archives, that's the link there to go to. You can find it off our main page. That gives you a link to everything we have. And it also looks at how you can get it, which is what we'll look at now. Actually, we will we'll look at special newspapers first, then you'll know, there's something else coming. So, um, as well as the main ones, we've got a few odd ones in the archives. Um, this is probably one of the most famous. Um, in World War One, soldiers in the front line couldn't get hold of newspapers. If they did, they were weeks old. Um, and so, as a way of keeping morale up, lots of newspapers, lots of so regiments write their own newspaper. The famous one we've all heard of is the Wipers Times, which was done. But actually, the 5th Gloucester Gazette was the first one, published by the 5th Gloucester Black Battalion. Um, and yeah, it became a very popular thing. We've got some copies of that, and they got, I think I've got a full run down at the Soldiers of Gloucestershire Museum. One that's less well known is the Rencombe Gazette. This is done by the Royal Flying Corps. Um, and again, just a two, two or three page little paper, news sheet basically. You know, you can imagine it being run off today, like it's like a school magazine on a Gestetner or something. Um, but there's usually a little bit of news, you know, lots of airplane topics, which are, which are quite, quite funny, which is like, you know, you get things like, oh, so and so, so and so has lost his gloves again. Can you find them? Fell out over Bybury or something like that, you know. So there's lots of information. You nearly always get a little song or a rhyme down there. So it, they are quite good to read. We've got about six or eight of them um, and that was all there was before they, they moved off sadly. 
So how do you look at how do you get to look at these? There, so there are three ways really of viewing these old newspapers and periodicals at the archives. So one, online. Okay, it's the easiest way, has to be said. Um, two, microfilm. A lot of us have used it, a lot of us love it, a lot of us loathe it as well. Um, or you can look at the hard copies, okay? We do try to ask people not to use the hard copies, basically because they're, you know, they again, they are so quite so fragile. Online and microfilm is the preferred way. However, how happy are you with technology is the thing. That's the thing. If you're not very happy with technology, go for the microfilm if it's on microfilm. Um, first thing to do check our guide the Gloucester newspapers is a guide to national and local newspapers and their holdings and specifically part two a quick reference guide to newspapers held at Gloucester archives and the local and family history centers this will basically tell you if we've got these things okay it will tell you where it's located as well and what format it is held in okay and it's really important to look at those because you know although we've got most of them at the archives you know we haven't got all of them so you know for example um the stride news and journal is over at stride a lot of the echo is at uh, at the cheltenham history center although we've got copies of that now i believe if it's microfilm okay we all know the microfilm room so i have self-service room there are three readers they're all different they all have their own should we say it unique personalities sometimes they work lovely sometimes they don't they can be frustrating they can be difficult to load they can be just uh, annoying but they are quite good um you know once you get used to how you use them it's it's they are quite easy to use um microfilm is all stored in the grey cabinets here they're all labeled okay if you do get them out to their self-service please 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 put them back in the right box um please also try and wind them back the right way if in doubt just come and ask us and we'll help you okay um you know because if we you'll take one out put it on you'll find it's backwards and upside down you know it's a real headache sometimes for us to try and figure out how we have to get it back to the other way each one's got its own storage box and they are all labeled so you know please please try that at your best if you can um online okay becoming far more popular okay um you can access them via Gloucester libraries or heritage hub um the gale databases so they give you access to the times digital archive which is the most important one in the british newspaper um news, british library newspapers the british newspaper library itself three million pages of newspaper from 742 local regional national papers from the 1700s onwards it's a fantastic resource and also find my past now you can access these in all sorts of different different ways um i'm not going to spend too much time on that because it basically come into the hub and we'll tell you how to do it hard copy some are not on microfilm okay so you can often order up the originals some are ever very very badly damaged just because they have these crumbly papers and we just can't produce them um most of these thankfully have been imaged elsewhere so that for example the chicksby register is the one i really remember but some of the journals you can actually lift the pages and you see the pages fall off so you know it's very often you know please don't shout and say sorry we can't get out because it is too badly damaged um searching them the beauty of using the online index is, is usually they are searchable whereas the hard copies aren't there are no indexes to the local newspapers the best one there is partly done is for the gloucester journal covers the whole of the 19th century it's mr dunn's indexes and you can see them in the search room eight blue ring binders there's one index volume and sub binders they are fantastic. These are the, one of the things I would run to and grab if ever there is a fire at the archives because they are irreplaceable. Blessed Mr. Dunn went through, he must have gone through all the paper. I don't know if he had anything else to do in the day, but this must have taken him years to do this. Um, and you can look up everything from circuses to fleas, basically. There's loads of things in there. Lots of news, ship arrivals, industry, that sort of thing, parties, you know, royal visits, they're all in these journals for that eighth. But it's, sadly, it's only that 19th 18th 19th century he did the 1800s he did so come to this one what's the biggest problem with looking at old newspapers there's one massive problem none of us can escape it it's rabbit holes 
you start looking at these new page newspapers you're looking for something specific you know roughly where it is the next thing you know you've been sat there three hours and you've moved one page it's so easy to look at some of the other stuff there because it's so wonderful it really is interesting and i'm i'm as guilty as anybody when it comes to this i don't tell my old boss uh, but i once spent four hours looking for one item on the paper and i realized i've been sat in the newspaper for literally four hours i've missed lunch and everything and i was just totally looking at this newspaper looking at all the little adverts little bits of news you know i don't know when it was about 1840 or something like that but it was fantastic so it's a really big problem so i'd say if you do come in to look at newspapers you're looking at them online don't expect it to get done really quickly it will take you a little bit of time because it's just so easy to get distracted so what happens if there's no news so today you're going to get celebrity news that sort of thing aren't you it's not always the case the journal once made at least five apologies for not having any news and if they had no news rather than print nothing they tended to print poetry but they'd always do it with a lovely little apology usually it's a this post afforded little news we take the liberty to insert this poem or you know and it says this day's post affords but little news we hope the following lines will be acceptable so they were they were quite happy to figure out actually there's no news we just print something nice instead of putting a picture of some celebrity on there I can't end with a couple of jokes for you. I like this one. What an amazing, clever dog we have, darling. He brings the newspaper in every day. We've never subscribed to any. Yeah. Which is quite good. But my favourite one has to be this one. What's a sheep's favourite newspaper? The Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible, isn't it? Um, so that's the end of the talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've had to gallop through it. It's a massive subject. Um, you can we'll have a uh, happy to try and answer questions now um use the chat facility or put your hand up if you have any that we think of later or we haven't answered you can please do email us and we'll try our best to answer them of course that's our website you can come and visit us so i hope you've enjoyed that little gallop through the newspapers and i'll hand back to kate for some if we have any questions Thank you very much, Ron. As usual, your enthusiasm is completely infectious. Um, do you mind um, stopping sharing your screen, John, and then I'll get the gallery view up and yep. see if there people we go. want to put their hands up. That's brilliant. Hang on, I'm just going to get rid of that. So, um, does anybody have any questions for John? If you can unmute yourself, maybe take your put your camera on so that I can see if you want to put your hands up. Anyone want to ask anything? Hello. Hello. Is that Rosaline? Rosaline? Yes, it's Rosaline. Hello, John. How are Hi, you? Rosaline. How are you doing? All right. Fine, thank you. Yeah. Um, a, a little comment. Uh, my husband used to referee football, and the, the game used to finish at about quarter to five. Yeah. He used to go into the local phone booth, <laughs> phone the citizen office with the result. And that uh, the the pinking came out at about half a six. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we were moving into our third or fourth point by then. I have to say, <laughs> you know, but it was incredible, good. really, absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, there, there. I, 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 it's not printed anymore, but it was it was such a good little resource, and it was again, yeah. he was amazed how often you'd often see people still reading it at ten o'clock at night. You know, in the I remember the Cinderford bar. You know, there'd be a disco going on next door. There'd be lots of drunk there. There's always somebody reading it. One of the best uh, things were, of course, the court cases, the assizes, and anybody on trial and hanging Again, and all yeah. that. That sold newspapers. They are. They are very good. They used to give, and it's always a good thing. If you've got, uh, for example, um, uh, a coroner's inquest, you're looking for a death, and you find we haven't got it, or it's very, very sort of very brief. You know, basically, often some of the coroner's reports we have, the official ones are basically this person died. You know, that's it. Often, if there's more to it, you'll often find really good reports in the journal of the citizen. The journal's best for that. Um, but again, the beauty of that is usually you'll know when the inquest has taken place, so you can virtually go straight to the newspaper or either online or on microfilm. But they do have excellent coroner's reports, has to be said. Yeah. Uh, John, there's a question in the chat um, from Neela, which says, um, brilliant, John, many thanks. Do you have any of the free newspapers in the archives? Do you buy free ones, Neela? Do you mean the sort of like the um, the actual? Uh, there's a, there, do you mean the more modern free papers or the yeah. old ones? We have some. Um, mm. There are some in the Gloucestershire collection. Generally, they're not they're not microfilmed. Although 
having said that, I think there are some of the Barclay ones area might be, but we do keep them where we can. There's a what they call the IP series in progress from the libraries. So where you get sort of like the, the freebies of today, that we do keep some of them. So I'd so I'd suggest email us in um, and then you know we'll set Andrew to work and if he can find it. That's the best way. We, so we do have stuff. Yeah. Cheltenham Shopping Week was the, the the earliest one I think in Cheltenham, which was about 50 years ago yeah yeah um and I then there was that. another one some years after that which was called the cheltenham journal that's right for the cheltenham ones have a word with the cheltenham library the local studies section because they they've got they've got quite a few we haven't it should all be on our online catalogue but it's taking time to put their collection on it we've got about a I think we've got about half to 60 percent at the moment so there's still a lot there neela no, so have Great. a look at those thank yeah. you john nice to see you by the way great to see you and you. I've got a question. Hello. Have you got any good tips for searching the newspapers online? So one of the challenges I find is that coroner's inquests have rarely survived for, for my family for whatever reason. How long after a death? would you expect an inquest to be and how long after that do you think so what i'm trying to ask is yeah. how much further forward should i be searching newspapers it's 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 a very it's a not a precise art unfortunately um very often when the inquest took place the newspapers would publish it especially if it was, a, if it was like a, a juicy story they would publish it quite quickly so the week after maybe two weeks after the actual inquest took place but the trouble is from the death to the inquest can be quite a long time um they tried to do them they tried to do them faster at one point but they could be up to six or eight months away from the actual death so it's quite a long span unfortunately um, and the only thing i can say is that's where looking online is easier because you could put a name you could put like you know john smith inquest or something like that that might search faster than you sat there you know with a windy mechanism trying to go through microfilms um, i think i've been too restrictive when i've been I'm expecting them to be quite quick. Yeah, that's it. So, I mean, sometimes they were. It's that's the trouble. It's it's it all depended. There were um, at a time there, there used to be four coroners in Gloucestershire. Then they moved into districts. But there's a period from about I think it's about 1730 to about 1840, where maybe 1830, where each coroner could do the whole district. So you know, you might be a couple of months getting back to his base and then pub, you know putting it, filing it. So it can be quite awkward. Um, so that's where possible have a look at the online ones just to try and pick up but if you've got a small newspaper and you're looking for it not always it's not always going to be there unfortunately um you know the, the death certificates don't give you any help either um so yeah no i'm afraid it's just a case of just go you know, expand your search a bit i would um, and try that thank you no worries. so anyone else hello <clears throat> here's one you didn't show Oh, all right. Hang on, Rosalind. Can we just have um, Anne's question, and I'll I'll come back to you if that's all right. Thank you. Go on, Anne. Thanks. Hello, John. Hi. Uh, am I right in thinking that the British Newspaper Archive, if you go to their own website, there's a better search engine than the one if you access it through Find My Past, or I... is that just a myth? Well, no. Funnily, I don't know. I. I... <laughs> I've been told that as well. And when I've searched for, I have searched for the odd thing, but I don't subscribe to it. So I just get the search bit. Um, and it does seem to be better, slightly better. I don't know why that should be, because it should be the same thing. Um, so what I would suggest is maybe search for it, you know, open it up on one screen, search for it, find it, then put the dates in to find my past and do it that way. But I've come across that before, whether it's just vagaries of blinking, um, you know, uh, algorithms something on the day, or whether it's actually you know, actually really is a different engine. I don't know, but I've 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 looked for something on Find My Past, couldn't find it. Went to the actual online index on the British newspaper library and found it quite quickly. I oh, don't that's know. Interesting. Mm, yeah, I suspect it's not supposed to be, but it might be. There might be something there. I don't know. So, I've got Rosaline, were you going to share us something? It's David Jones, actually. Um, this is a, an interesting paper. It's The Citizen from 1959. 
uh, and it's actually typed. Um, oh, right. And it notes on the top, I don't know whether you can read it there, published in uh, at time of newspaper strike. So oh, for yeah. two weeks, they did it as a, as a typed issue. Blimey, that's a good one, isn't it? It's wow, like, um, incredible. Yeah. That well, should be in your archive, of course. It should friend. be. I was going to say, what have, you, what have you got it for? Bring it in. <laughs> yeah. um, I've seen that um, message from Tracy, um, but Tracy think, agrees that searching the VNA own site is, is better. Mm. So, um, I don't know why. Tracy, but, did, you, did you want to um, say something? Uh, yeah, sorry, I just have to unmute. I'm on my phone, so it's a bit more difficult. Um, yeah, um, I went through the Find My Past, but it sent me, it had to, it kept sending me and asking me to subscribe. Um, so I've actually taken out a short subscription for the light, um, British National um, um, yeah, yeah, newspaper, newspaper archive yeah. um and it yeah it's much better because i've actually found i've been trying to find um i've got ancestors Schweitzer, um, um and i know my great grandfather he was um he was bank he became he went into bankruptcy um and i found a lot of articles picking up that um but i've also found up like you say that rabbit hole <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I start on one bit and i've gone through <laughs> um yeah um yeah because you can do a yeah search but it does pick up the only thing it does if you can put um it's sometimes uh, limited on what you can actually search for um because i've tried searching for um a great aunt um who i found out was became was an actress um and yeah i put her name in but yeah you get rather a lot <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it's the, so it's but the it was really with, interesting yeah it's always the trouble with the searches isn't it it's like how how far do you expand it and how far do you narrow it narrow yeah. it too much you get nothing expand it by one word and you get millions it's, it's very difficult of course it all depends on what the keywords are they tag for it but that's nice that's good to know that is that it is easier yeah um, it's good the, though and when it picks up the search um it obviously what you've put in your search um in the actual article it um highlights it because as you say the pages are rather big and tiny print but yeah. so you can hope you can zoom in on so that's good yeah, yeah. Well, I have a, a different question, uh, and that is, I, I'm confused by the copyright situation. Yeah. Um, when you use British um, newspaper newspaper archive, they they list different types of copyright condition depending on where the archive is. So, is the copyright that they are citing on the digital image of the newspaper? Because clearly copyright on Victorian newspapers has long expired. Mm. I don't really understand what the situation is in respect of then replicating it into newsletters I, as I am doing. Yeah, join the club. <laughs> I don't think okay. anybody understands copyright the earliest. Um, it's very, all I know is it's a complete minefield. It really is very difficult. I think there is something about, you know, if you've made a copy, your copy, you get the copyright vested in that copy you've made. I don't know how they've done it. Um, I would suggest you drop us an email and we'll pass it on to Paul Evans, who's the nearest thing we have to a copyright expert, and he, he can sweat over it and see how he does it. There might be ways around it, but it is a complete, absolute, minefield copyright it's it's awful um you know the, the, i love it when you go onto a site like the british library where they've actually say you can reuse this image so it's always worth checking you know in how to reuse this image and you'll find lots of times it's you know obviously licensable chargeable but there are quite a few um that that are i mean so the british library not the newspaper side but the main side they let you use it for whatever purpose virtually especially if it's non non-profit making you just use it which is great i love that um but yeah the actual newspapers it, it's it's quite something else that's why all the images you saw today are ones we've got apart from one or two i think it was um, where i had to go and get special permission to use them so i don't know the difference um you know this is the sort of thing that lawyers love. They you have copyright lawyers fighting over these sorts of things. But if you have a, drop us an email, we'll pass it on to Paul and he can have a think about it. I think that's the best way. Okay. <laughs> can, I just, can I just come in here? Um, 
Uh, I, I, I'm an expert in copyright law. Oh, <laughs> <I'm Nina. laughs> Surely, John, you remember the lectures I gave. Um, yeah. Mind you, that was 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> I, I worked for 13 years for a, a major publisher uh, as a copyright editor. Um, and I can tell you that, yeah, there are various layers of copyright and what, what you've got with the British newspaper archives is the fact that they spent the money, if you look at it in these terms, they spent the money digitizing those, those uh, copies that you see, which is why they have the copyright to it. Um, and they don't like you using it because you might be making money out of it. Um, however, if you come across anything that is um, um, copyright free, uh, it's, it's otherwise known as copyright left, um, you, you need to look at the license because the Creative Consortium license will tell you whether you can do what you like with it or whether you can print it but you need to write where the source was or whether you need to apply. Yeah, yeah, it is, it's very complicated. Thanks, Nina. That's really helpful. Yeah. So are we... Um, go on, Rosalind. Can I just add two naughty little comments? <laughs> um, John Mortimer, who worked for the Citizen Office, he always used to say the uh, uh, P's and Q's is because they used to have to make sure they put the P uh, in, with all the little letters for the... Can you imagine composing a newspaper with all those little letters? Oh, no. Incredible. Don't know, and, it? and the other thing is, I was always told that the word newspaper came from North, East, West and South. I think that's um I was asking somebody about that and it that it I, I don't I think that's a problem but I don't think that is what it's from. Yes. It works though. Yes. <laughs> Thanks Ross. That's uh, okay, nice to see you. Anyway, it was lovely. Thank you all very much for coming. This Thank will be much. going online, we'll put it on our website. Unfortunately I forgot to record about the first twenty seconds so it's <laughs> yeah. Opening, but it's, a bit. it's lovely. Thank you all for coming, and see you all next time. The next one is about oh, it's, big, um, it's big, about asylums, all about history, asylums, and and that will be done by Sally and um, Kim. Uh, Red Holt hosting that one. So we're looking at I think it's looking at Gloucester asylums and just how about the how this sort of how mental health was treated back back in the day, as it were. So that'd be quite an interesting one as well. Thank you very yeah. much, everyone. Take care. See Thank you, you very much. Bye.